Good afternoon. My name is Aaliyah Matthews, and I'm a human development and family studies major and a women's gender and sexuality studies major at University of North Carolina Greensboro. And I'll be introducing Alexandra Wilson. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alexandra Wilson. I am a poli-sci major and an African diaspora studies major and a minor in history and a minor in social sociology. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. Okay, so to start us off today, I just wanna get a little bit of background um, just about you and your life. So where are you from and what was it like growing up there? I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I technically lived all my life in Pineville, but it's basically Charlotte. And for as long as I've remembered, I can remember we've lived in the same house and my neighborhood has been, it was majority white, my family was the first black family to live in the cul-de-sac that we lived in. We were also the first house built, but, um, and slowly but surely we started to get more, more people of color because our neighbors across the street are black and then a couple houses down, there's some Indian families. So we've kind of, the neighborhood's kind of progressed in a way, but I really, I didn't know there was that many black people in my, uh, in my uh, neighborhood until I got to middle school. Cause I went to, an elementary school that was kind of further away from my uh, high school. It wasn't the high, high school <laughs> further away from my neighborhood that wasn't very close to my neighborhood. So nobody in my neighborhood went there. And when I got on the middle school bus, I saw like a whole bunch of black kids get on. And I was like, I remember being literally, I remember being excited, like, hey, black people. But um, growing up in that neighborhood, it was never, it was never bad. Like I, I enjoyed living there up until like, few years ago when the neighbors next to us rented out their house to whomever they could rent it to. But um, no, I, I, really, I really enjoyed living in that neighborhood. And so going to a different school farther away from your neighborhood, did you experience any like differences between where you were going to school and where you lived, if that makes sense? Um, so the, neighbor, the school that I went to was a magnet program, a Montessori school. So in a Montessori school, we don't really sit at desks and we kind of like sit on the floor or the table or wherever and we kind of teach ourselves. So the other kids, I mean, I really know that, noticed that much of a difference, but I was kind of like the outsider because everybody in my neighborhood went to the same elementary school, except for me. But differences, not really. The main difference is when I got to middle school and I had to start sitting at a desk and I had to start doing like structured learning that was when I really noticed the difference. But I, all in all, I really feel like my Montessori school helped me in being like, um, like helping, like helping myself teach myself, helping myself to just be proactive in my learning and my education. But I don't really think that there was that much of a difference going to a school farther away from where I lived. Now that we have a little bit of background about you, um, being from Charlotte or Pineville, um, what cities did you participate in protesting and how did you find out about those protests? So I really wanted to participate in some Charlotte protests, but being that I go to school in Greensboro and I have an apartment here, I protested in Greensboro because it was closer. Um, and I found out about those protests via Twitter. My roommate and I, like Twitter is our favorite app. So we're, she was scrolling and she saw that somebody had said that there was going to be a protest in downtown Greensboro and she asked if I wanted to go and at first I was like ah, I don't know it's gonna be, gonna be a lot of people and it's coronavirus outside but as I like started to see more information about it and more people saying that like they wanted to go and how like it just seemed very like if it seems very organized and I was like okay yeah let's do it let's go so we made uh signs for the protests, um, it was like a little art project for us because we had paint and markers and like these big old pieces of paper. And then we just went out and protested. And actually on our way to the protests, we saw, this is gonna sound bad, we saw this guy walking and we pulled over and asked where he was going. And he said he was going to the protests. So we were like, well, hey, do you wanna get in? You wanna ride with us? And the dude was like, yeah, sure, it's hot outside. So we like rode all the way to the protest and he got out and he went about his day and we went about ours, protested. So with the kind of like worry about 
um, coronavirus and how crowded everything was. Um, if you can recall, like what feeling or moment pushed you to join the protest despite those like worries? Honestly, if I really think about it, I think the protest, I think in general, the protest was just necessary. Like everywhere, like literally everywhere in the country, there was a protest going on. And I wanted to be able to say that I was a part of something bigger than myself. So I was like, let's do it. And I tried to get my other roommate and her sister to go, but it didn't line up for them. But me and my other roommate went and I just, I really just remember thinking like, I want to be a part of something bigger. I don't want to feel like I missed out on making a difference and making a change. Cause I remember when I was still in Charlotte for like full time, there was a protest and I think it was for, I think it was, I want to say after Trayvon Martin, maybe there was a protest going on. And I remember thinking like, I want to be a part of it, but I was also like too young to go. And my parents certainly weren't going to let me go by myself. So I just remember thinking I wanted to be a part of that. And then now that I'm older and my parents aren't here, I can't tell me what to do. I was like, I'm going to go protest. So we did. And it was really, it was really a sight to see um, because I, like, I want to say, maybe 90% of the protests had masks on. So we weren't, we start, We tried to be as distant as possible, as pos as much as you can be in a protest, but most people had masks on and it was very, it just seemed very organized because there were speakers and then they were like, okay, we're gonna march. There's people handing out waters. There was people handing out masks. There were um, of course t-shirt sellers, but like it, it seemed organized and I don't, and, I don't think that I honestly was going to catch any type of virus from it. And I did some research and there hasn't been any records of spikes of um, coronavirus because of protests. So it was, I, it seemed worth it to me. You actually covered um, two of my next questions. So you weren't worried about um, contracting COVID while you were out protesting and you saw um, protesters and organizers helping other people out while at the protest, like with masks and water. Yeah, um, I remember, like, I remember when I texted my parents that I was gonna go protest, they were like, okay, well, stay safe, stay hydrated, because it was really hot that day. It was like, I wanna say, it was like the first week of June, so it was definitely hot. And, um, and then the masks don't make anything better when it's already hot outside, it's already hard to breathe. But I remember that there were like kids and like, um, it was a group and I can't remember the name of their group, but they were like telling people about their group while also handing out water bottles and like chips and stuff. And everybody kept yelling, stay hydrated, stay hydrated. Uh, I don't even, I personally didn't see anybody like pass out because of the heat or anything, but I grabbed like two water bottles and I didn't even need them. I had my own water bottle, but I just wanted to make sure that I was hydrated and I did end up drinking both of them. So I guess I did end up needing them, but we really tried to stay hydrated, especially because it was hot and, um, and we had the masks on. Ma like, cause I don't, with my glasses and then the mask, I'm like, everything's fogging up. I'm already, and I have like a small case of asthma. So then like, I'm already like, trying to breathe struggling to breathe and so I really I definitely needed the water so everybody was out there passing out water snacks and stuff um and actually it was a lot most of the people passing out water were actually white people um they were it was like I don't know I, it just seemed maybe it was just a coincidence but it was a lot of like all the people passing out water bottles were white people they were dragging their coolers and saying like hey um do you guys need water do you guys need water and People were like, yeah, I'll take a bottle. I'll take a bottle. And then there wasn't, is okay, there wasn't a lot of littering with the bottles. Like, I think that's just important to know. Like, a lot of people, like, picked up their bottles and threw it in the trash. Or somebody would pick up a bottle that they did see. But I didn't see a lot of, like, littering. So the protest wasn't, like, disruptive in that manner. So um, you mentioned that a lot of the people handing out water bottles and stuff were white people. Um, did you see kind of, I guess, a surge of allyship as far as um, white people and other backgrounds showing up to support at the protests? 
That's a really good question. Yes, yes, I did. Um, specifically, the one that was most amazing to me was that they say when a they say a protest um, that's not disruptive that doesn't bother the people around you is just a parade, and I think our protest did disrupt because it was blocking off traffic. People like there were still cars trying to drive by or drive through, and I saw that the white people would like come from wherever they were in the protest and move to the front. And they would like build like a wall between cars or police officers, wherever it may be within the protest and the black protesters. They made sure to put themselves first. And they would, I remember they would yell, they would say like, okay, I don't want to say they said white people to the front, but essentially that's what they were saying, like white people to the front. And like, you would just see people like running up to the front and like, linking up so that they so that they could build a barrier between the two of us so there was definitely allyship and then as far as the protest it was very it was very diverse um i think one of the people chanting like um one of the chants like this is what democracy looks like was uh, was led by a, a white female in the protest had i mean the protest had kids had adults of course had uh um Hispanic people that were Latinx people, black people, of course, white people. There was like, it was very diverse. Um, and then I saw a lot and a lot of them were college students. So I saw a lot of people I had classes with or were in clubs with. Um, but yeah, so there was definitely an allyship between, well, f from the white people that were there. And so you mentioned, um that the allies, specifically white allies, creating that wall between um, like black protesters or like the majority and anything that might've been in their way. Um, in reference to like kind of, I guess like what they need to be protected from, was there any police presence or was there a lot of police presence at the protests you participated in? Yes, there was a police presence. Um, there, I think mainly they were just there to kind of block off traffic for us at one point. Like, I guess, since we were already kind of blocking off traffic on our own, I think they were mainly there to block off the traffic. There wasn't really like, it wasn't like a negative president, pr president, presence, um, cause I didn't see much of like any anything negative between the protesters and the police officers were like non-existent, at least when I, what I saw. I, um, there were times where the police officers were like lined up in their own, like on their own side of the street. And then the protesters were on the other side of the street and they were kind of like protesters were kind of like yelling back at them and, um, protesting, like, uh, yelling chants towards them, but the police kind of just stood there. Um, and they did, and it was during the time when we had the curfew in Greensboro, and and I, the curfew was really early too and so then um they were at one point trying to like kind of enforce the curfew but um it didn't really make a difference to the protesters because we were going to be heard and we were going to protest so aside from the diversity of the crowd that you mentioned is there anything else that you remember about the crowd um maybe like the energy of the crowd or even just um, I guess like the actions. Yes. Okay. So there was this one older white lady who said, like, you, I know you've seen like the pictures on social media where it's like, I can't believe it's 2020 and we're still fighting the same fight. There was one older white lady that was like, um, she either had a sign or a shirt that said the same thing. She was like, I'm still fighting out here. And then there was one older black lady. And I remember her specifically because I took a picture of her because she she was full of energy. She was like walking, but she was kind of like dancing while she was walking and she was chanting. And there was a, we had a moment of silence. It was for, um, it was for George Floyd and his uh, seven minutes, I believe. We had like seven minutes of silence where everybody got on their knees and just like was quiet. And she, well, it was a wonder that she got down on her knees anyway, because she said that her knees were bad and she shouldn't be kneeling, but she kneeled anyway. And she had her hand up, you know, raised. And 
there was a younger girl standing next to her and she I guess she her knees were given out on her because she couldn't crouch down for long and the older lady was like come on baby you can lean on me and they didn't know each other and the girl did lean on her and they like sat that sat like that for a while and she the older lady was funny too because her chant was it was kind of vulgar but her chant was definitely um along the lines of I'm not gonna be quiet and I'm gonna speak my mind and you guys are gonna hear me but her energy was definitely one to watch like me and my roommate kind of walked behind her for a little while because she was just so funny and so full of full of energy like all the people around her like whenever people were walking by her they were like started dancing with her and um chanting with her but she she definitely had an energy about her and she's been out here before I can definitely tell that she's been out here before and she will continue to do so until she can no longer be out there so in feeling that energy and kind of like mentioning that people were like feeding off of each other in the crowd were there any specific feelings um that you recall that you felt um I didn't want to leave <laughs> I really I really enjoyed being out there um like the heat doesn't, it, it didn't bother me that much. Like it wasn't noticeable up until like we were walking to our car and then we were like, oh God, it's hot outside. But um, the, I didn't want to leave. I really liked the atmosphere of it all. Like seeing all the different people out there, seeing the allyship of the white people that were, you know, um, running to the front. And then when like, when our seven minutes of silence was up and then there were some speakers, in their microphone or their bullhorn or whatever wasn't that loud for the amount of people that was out there. However, people were like, she said, like they were like telling the people behind them so that like the message could get passed along. And then my roommate and I wanted to take a picture, uh, but we wanted to take one together. And so we just stopped somebody and we're like, hey, do you mind taking a picture of us? And she was like, yeah, sure. And she took like, several a good amount of pictures and was like oh these look great you guys have fun out here and you guys um be safe and like she walked away and I was just like that was nice of her like because usually when you ask somebody to take a picture of you it's like one or two but she took a good amount of pictures and um I just really no I just really liked the atmosphere of it all and I think that's what's most important. Like it shows the unity. It shows that this is not just a black issue, that this is a human rights issue because everybody of all different races, um, sexual sexualities, uh, religions, whatever, they're all out there protesting and saying the same things. You know, it just really shows the unity and that this is not a singular issue, that this is something that we need to fix because when a large group of people are protesting something, then there's something wrong, that there's something that needs to be addressed. There's a disconnect between the government and the people. And then that draws attention to the issues at hand. And then we can get movement within our, um, within the chain, like get movement and get change happening. However, it's kind of slow, but it happens with these being issues that do affect everyone um, and that they're not just, you know, a singular issue that affect black people, they are human rights, human rights issues, I'm sorry. Was there anyone in your life that tried to like deter you or discourage you from protesting? And was there anyone in your life who encouraged you to protest? Um. Okay, so my dad is a police officer and he has been since 2004. So for basically as long as I can remember. And he didn't discourage me from protesting. He definitely was like, use your voice, you know, be heard.
So as far as the protest being a human's right, human rights issue, not just a black issue and it being something that's important to everyone, were there any people in your life who tried to deter or discourage you from protesting? And was there anyone in your life who encouraged you to protest? Um, okay, so my dad has been a police officer for basically as long as I can remember. He's been a police officer since 2004. And I wouldn't necessarily say that he discouraged, he tried to discourage me from uh, protesting because he's always said like, use your voice and the younger generation is going to be the change in society. But I do feel like he, like his stance on certain issues are like, they're off to me. And I feel like he feel like he feels that the when I protest, I'm protesting him. And I'm not necessarily protesting him, but because I know the person that he is. But I'm protesting that badge that he wears and everything that comes behind it. But um, I wouldn't say that he tried to stop me from protesting. But he was always trying to make me hear the um, police side of things and. I mean, I guess it's good to always know the two sides of one issue, but um, I'm still not the biggest uh, supporter of his job. But um, other people trying to discourage me from protesting, I, there was this one boy, he told me, and I don't even want to say his name because it was so rude, but he said, you're into that protesting thing. He was like, you're going to get shot in the head like other protesters. And I felt like that was so extreme, so drastic. And I was just like, I just had to tell him like, if you don't stand up for something, then you're gonna fall for anything. You have to have, you have to have some type of, like something behind you. You have to have some type of cause to stand behind. So really kind of ignored him. But I mean, no one really, discourage me from protesting because if I want to protest and if I want my voice to be heard I'm gonna let it be heard um and then as far as uh other people that really encourage me to protest I would say like I would just say like my experiences really because in high school I was a part of the NAACP um chapter at our school and just being a part of that and seeing that our, our president at the time he was just so like he was such an activist and I was like, I wanna be like you. So uh, I would say that encouraged me. And even my elementary school, like being, being that I went to a Montessori school and um, it, seeing things differently and un, learning things differently, we always used to, we didn't just learn about black history during February. Like a lot of, a lot of the times that's only, this only time black history comes up in school, but we didn't. And my very first teacher at school taught me about um, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. And that was, I was three, I was like three, four. And that wasn't in February. And we learned, we learned about, you know, standing up for people and everybody deserves the same, you know, let's, like equality and stuff like that. So I guess really just my experience is what um, pushed me to protest. And I wouldn't say anyone really discouraged me because I'm gonna protest. I want my voice to be heard. When you reflect on your experience protesting overall, um, who or what would you say was your why for protesting? Like specifically, what were you protesting for? Um. Okay, so I, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up and I'm still deciding on what, well, when I graduate, I wanna to go to law school. So, but I'm still deciding on what type of law I wanna practice. But anytime that I see a great injustice done, especially by our justice system, it just, it like, it disgusts me. Like that is, that is the reason why I wanna protest so much because the fact that the murderers, uh, it, like the murderers get to walk home, like go home free, or the fact that like Breonna Taylor's murderers are not being charged for it. The fact that one of the officers is trying to sue Breonna Taylor's boyfriend for like emotional distress or something, or the fact that Dylan Roof got walked into the jail with a bulletproof vest on after he murdered a great amount of people in a church. The fact that George Zimmerman is signing Skittle bags as if he's a celebrity and he sold his gun that he used to kill Trayvon Martin. Like all of those facts, the fact like the fact that none of them are really, really suffering the consequences of what they did and how they've harmed people is the reason why I protest. Like 
It's just a great injustice done. And I know that them going to jail would, ne would not bring all these people back. However, it would be some type of justice. And I mean, and, and even jail is not even like the best, you know, part of our system. I just feel like if we're going to call the justice system, the justice system, then there needs to be some justice within the system. The fact that there are people serving life sentences or on death row who are innocent. The fact that the um, exonerated five even had to be exonerated, like the fact that they were even in the position that they were in. And I remember like learning about that when I was smaller. And I remember thinking like, how is that even possible? How, how are you not like, how are you innocent and in jail? How are you not guilty and you're in jail? How are you serving time for something you didn't do? Like that, it didn't, it didn't make sense in my head. And I think that's really what got me into law because I saw that they had a lot of help from the Innocent Project and then they gave back after the fact. And I just really feel like there is no reason why our justice system should look the way it is. So that is why I'm protesting. I want to make a difference within the justice system. And that's why I wanna to go to law school because then I wanna become a lawyer and try to work within the system to change the system. So in thinking about all of your reasons for why you protested, what things have you seen change since protesting or what things would you like to see change as a result of the protests? Um, Things that have changed. Um, I feel like a lot more, I feel like a lot more people are on board with this type of change. You know, like initially it felt like black people, the black people were the only people that cared about black issue, well, the black issues. But now it's starting to see like more people are chanting Black Lives Matter, more people are doing the research and trying to figure out how we can change, you know, more people are just on board. And I think that's what's really been, really been the biggest change. As far as like change and how things are done, I wouldn't, I don't think there's been much change done. However, there's been a little bit of progress, just a little bit like, um, I know, and I only speak on CMPD because that's my dad works, but um, I remember when they got body cams and I remember um, how big of an issue that was. And then my dad tells me that when the body cam, like you are responsible for turning on the body cam, which I think is kind of like, you know, you shouldn't be the one holding that. But he made a good point because he said, you know, what if we stop to go use the bathroom? You want us to be recording that too? But I, um, that was a very big thing. And the fact that um, we're getting some black police chiefs, like Charlotte has had, this is their second one now. Um, and these are the change, these are changes. They may not be big changes, but the fact that we even have a body cam, that's really good. And if you don't, if you um, neglect to turn on your body cam and uh, CMPD, that's, that's grounds for expulsion. You'll get in trouble for that. And the the dash cam also, there's just, there's been some small changes, some small progress, but not big enough to say that, to, for me to say that since I was little and to now that I can really see the difference. Honestly, I feel like things got a little bit more hectic from when I was little to now. I don't feel like there's been a big change. I just feel like um, there's just been a little bit of progress and just the fact that we're being heard somewhat because um, these protests and these Black Lives Matter events and, and our chants and stuff, they're being talked about on a large scale, like in the presidential debate, though they're kind of blown through and it's kind of just a talk, talking point, it's still something that's brought up. And it's still like a deciding factor for some people who they're gonna choose between which candidate, but between the candidates. So I feel like we're being heard now and there's more people on board. I just wouldn't say there's a big change that's happened. And is there anything specific that you would like to see change or any specific action that you would like to see done? Um, I think not just, I think for one, I think the there needs to be some 
something concrete for the LGBTQ community because I feel like every four years they have to show that they're, you know, they're worth something. Like they, like uh, Trump recently had um, put a bill for that uh, shelters, homeless shelters can refuse somebody based on looks so that that it's in that like really affects the transgender community and it really affects the lgbtq community and i feel like there should be some something concrete where they don't have to feel like they have to fight every four years just to be seen as people um i feel like there should be more extensive um work done to determine whether or not somebody is even guilty for them to go to jail. I mean, I, I know we're supposed to like trust in the justice system, the jury and, you know, the prosecution and the uh, defense and all that and the judge, but something's not working. So that something needs to change about that. Um, and I feel like there should most definitely be an instant consequence to when an officer kills an unarmed person not just a black person, not just LGBTQ, but person in general, because people say that black people only pro protest um, the, un the killing of an unarmed black person, but we don't protest the unarmed killing of a white person. But that's because we're not seeing them on camera being murdered. And then also because they're not with us. Like, why, like we, we're protesting police in general. We're not just protesting a black issue, but y'all aren't standing with us. We can, we'll, we'll protest with you, but protest with us as well. Um, I think, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I just, I feel like there's a lot to be done and we, and, and they're all definitely like viable options. Like there are definitely things that can get done. Um, I really just lost my train of thought. The, um, they're just all viable options. I'm just gonna cut it there. I don't remember what I was gonna say, but um, there's definitely, there's definitely a lot to be done and there's definitely, there are definitely things that can be done. Um, Oh yes, uh, there shouldn't be, like when someone is murdered by the police, by the police, there shouldn't, it shouldn't be a matter of, um, like it shouldn't be a matter of the police union being able to get them off. It should be, did you or did you not do the act? Because the, the split second it takes for you to decide whether or not you're gonna pull that trigger, um, it, it's a major second. because. For my dad personally, he's been in a situation where he went to a school that was being that was that some kids were trying to rob for like their iPads or computers or something, and the kids had BB guns in the hall and it was at night so the hallway was dark and my dad saw this kid with a BB gun and it, from the distance and the lighting it looked like a real gun. And my dad took the time to yell at the kids several times to drop his weapon and I feel like a lot, and I'm not just saying, you know, my dad's great and all, but I feel like a lot of officers are not taking that second to analyze the situation because there's no reason why you should be able to shoot somebody for holding a cell phone and then getting away with it. Whereas my father had the time to determine whether or not that gun was a BB gun or a real gun. He he had the time to tell that young man to drop his weapon. And he yelled at that man, the young man for maybe like, he said maybe like five or so times. And that's a lot of times to tell somebody to drop their weapon. And my dad said, the kid event, the kid was sitting there thinking like, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Because at first the kid was scared because he even got caught. And then he's like, now this officer, there's, there's, there's a gun in this officer's hand, what, what if he shoots me? And then the kid is thinking, okay, well, I'm gonna drop the weapon. Other officers don't let the kid get to the third, the third option. Don't let them get to that third thinking process. So I feel like there should be more training, but then there's also should be more consequences. You should not be able to get away with the things that had people have been getting away with. Those are definitely um, big changes that need to be made. And that was my last question for this interview. So I just wanted to thank you for your time and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.